We can speak out now as a nation with one voice on the sensitive issue of human rights all around the world because Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights movement helped to liberate all Americans from the chains of official racism here at home. Had he not lived, had his voice not been heard, had his actions not prevailed, it would now be an embarrassment for the United States to mention the word human rights in international councils. Daddy King spoke the truth when he said, too many people think Martin frees only black people. In truth, he helped to free all people. Now the challenge facing all of us today, and particularly government, is to stay true to the trust placed in America by the Civil Rights Movement and Martin Luther King Jr. He trusted our country. He trusted our government. He trusted our people. Even when an objective observer would say in complete truth, there were times when our government, its laws, and many of its people didn't deserve to be trusted. Let no one doubt where I stand. Man. My administration and I personally stand with you. We are committed to civil rights. We are committed to equal opportunity. We are committed to equal justice under the law, and you can depend on it. As President of the United States, representing now 220 million people, I pledge to you that I will continue to strengthen and to enforce the civil rights laws of the land firmly and without equivocation, not only the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law as well. Many of those responsible for enforcing civil rights laws in our government today are people who struggle alongside you in the battle for civil rights. People like Eleanor Holmes Norton and Drew Days and Wade McCree and many others. And I pledge to you that they not only have my full support as president, but they have the encouragement of many others who work with me in government, like John Lewis, who's here, Andy Young, in the enforcement of equal opportunity. I might say that Andy was planning on being here today, but about 2.30 this morning, the uh, Secretary of State had to call Andy for a special assignment and he's not able to be here, but his spirit is with us, and Gene, his wife, is here. In our government, we will not authorize federal tax money, your tax money, to fund or pay for discrimination. <laughs> it's difficult to root out because sometimes it's hard to find an influential people benefit from different aspects of discrimination in hiring practices, in promotion of employees, in housing, in redlining, bank loans. But we must do more than correct these defects. For, for too many years, we have passed equal rights laws and administered equal rights laws from a city where 700,000 Americans are denied.
he was no longer president. And he said, to be black in a white society is not to stand on level and equal ground. While the races may stand side by side, whites stand on history's mountain and blacks stand in history's hollows. The only way to overcome unequal history, yes, which leaves discrimination when the laws are equal, is to promote and defend and enforce the equal opportunity for all disadvantaged Americans in this land. And that, again, is what we will do. But we must and we will do more, much more. It's not enough to have a right to sit at a lunch counter if you can't afford to buy a meal. And a ghetto looks the same even when you're sitting in the front end of a bus. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream lives among us today. But too many individual dreams have died in rat-ridden slums and decaying homes and rotting neighborhoods. Dreams are dying. Yes. There are still hundreds of thousands of young people, yes, many of them minority youth in our country who have never had a chance to hold a decent job. They learn in our streets, not in our schools. And they learn about drugs and alcohol and crime, and not about religion or medicine or mathematics or law. We cannot permit another generation of Americans to grow up with no hope. In the last two years, we have been able to add more jobs in this country than any other time in the history of our nation. But we've still got a long way to go. And I'm proud that we joined together. Coretta King, I, the members of the Congress, Senator Talmadge, Elliot Levitas, and many others, last year, and wrote the promise of full employment into the laws of our land by passing the Humphrey Hawkins Bill. We have begun to put our people back to work, but we must do more. We must stop the inflation that's robbing the poor and those who live on a small fixed income and the aged who are retired and the young people who are still struggling economically to find a future that will make them happy and fulfill their expectations and their potential. We are blessed in our country with a strong economy, but I want to make it stronger I want to build an economy so fair and equitable, so creative, so vital, so free, that every able American can have pride and dignity and self-respect that comes from an honest job, doing honest work with constant growth in that person's life. For the first time now, we're also expanding to minority-owned businesses a fair share of the benefits of our great free enterprise system, and that progress will continue. We must and we will continue to provide every child in America a chance to learn and to flower and to grow Amen. with the best education we can provide. Last year, we added to the federal education budget about $12 billion, more than had ever been added before because we know that what the Negro College Fund brochures say is right. A mind, a human mind, is a terrible thing to waste. And that's why in a budget that will fight inflation, I have preserved and will fight for new support, increased support, to educate disadvantaged children in our nation for Head Start, for the handicap, and for the struggling college student that wants to realize his potential.
Dr. Benjamin Mays reminds me often that in a time of need, this nation's historically black colleges were a haven of opportunity for all those who were denied their equal chance to learn. Martin Luther King, Jr. spoke out also against what he saw as a tragic moral flaw of our country in the Vietnam War. And in a moving address exactly one year before he died, he went beyond advocating an end to the war to demand what he called, and I quote, a true revolution of values a world revolution, peaceful in nature, that he felt America was uniquely qualified to lead. He insisted that we look at both our political and our economic relations with other countries around the world and hold to a standard of justice, both domestic and internationally. And I'm determined as president to hold our nation to a high standard of justice in dealing with other nations to restore America's leadership in a peaceful world, a revolution that demands freedom and justice and self-determination, not just for ourselves, but for all people. To help me in that effort, I've got at the United Nations a man, sometimes quiet and timid, a man as good as any who has ever represented any nation in any government my good friend, Andy Young. For many people around the world, those who are poor, hungry, black, brown, yellow, from little nations, the United States government is Andy Young. They trust him. They trust him. And in their trust for him, I gain their trust. And when Andy Young and I gain their trust, the people of this nation gain their trust. And as I have said many times, it's a delight now to face a session of the United Nations General Assembly because we are no longer the target of every attack. We are no longer the butt of every joke. We are a people now who reach out a hand of equality and friendship and mutual respect, where formerly there was antagonism and a chasm that could not be crossed. And I thank Andy Young for it, and I thank those on the stage with me and Martin Luther King Jr. for helping to train Andy Young so well. This administration is working to restore America's moral authority in the world. As I've said before, human rights is the soul of our country's foreign policy. And as long as I'm president, America will continue to lead the struggle for human rights. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we must lay hands on the world order and say of war, this way of settling differences is not just. He said that the crucial political and moral question of our time was the need to overcome oppression and violence without resorting to oppression and violence. It's still a difficult but a crucial question. I'm trying to perpetuate and to spread the peace 
which our nation, thank God, now enjoys. To use our moral force and our good offices to get ancient enemies, to lay aside their differences so that the energies and the talents of their people can be used to produce better lives instead of suffering and death. In Southern Africa, we are working with the leaders and the people there, a people long deprived of basic rights, to bring about majority rule, an end to racism and hatred, and to terminate the legal sanctioning of apartheid throughout that great continent. In Nicaragua, we are working with other countries to mediate a dispute and to bring about freedom and democratic principles in one of our neighboring countries. In the Middle East, we are trying to act as a mediator under the most difficult possible political circumstances to bring about peace between two ancient enemies. We've made a great deal of progress because of the desire of those people for peace. This week, we'll dispatch another delegation of negotiators and mediators to the Mideast to resolve the last elements of differences on language of the peace treaty itself. And then we will address a very major political question of how to carry out the fullest terms of the Camp David Accords. At that moment, it being a political question, I'm sure that this will be elevated at least to the Secretary of State level. And if necessary, I will not hesitate to invite President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin to meet with me again to get a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt. A united America, with your support, gives us a strong and a vital voice that can be heard abroad. In closing, let me say that I was trained in the art of war. But I share this dream of Martin Luther King, Jr., that mankind can find a better way. Our generation knows too much of war. We've seen it as it is. It's thousands of tons of bombs falling in the middle of night. It's misery and death in a wet and lonely foxhole on a frozen mountainside or in a steaming jungle without fanfare and without glory. The poor who were not able to pay for a college education were the first to go to war and to give their lives to a country that had made it possible for them to be deprived of opportunity. This must never happen again. <laughs> War as a little dying child, crying in a burning village, an old man bearing his only son with a heart that can never be comforted it's a destruction of the human spirit and of all that we have that's beautiful or valuable. War holds a real threat of massive nuclear annihilation. Only madmen today can believe that war is a solution of anything. We're trying to reach out a hand of friendship to past enemies, to heal differences, and to provide for world peace. We're in the last stages of negotiating a SALT II agreement that will limit the further spread of nuclear weapons between us and the Soviet Union and will set for the world a clear example that our nation stands for peace. This treaty, which I have personally supervised in its negotiation, will protect our nation's security interests. It will provide the prospect for future progress in the future, in years to come, to cut down further on nuclear weapons. And it will be presented to the Senate for ratification as a treaty as soon as it's concluded. A rejection of this treaty would deal a severe blow to the prospects for peace around the world. It would deal a severe blow to the control and the containment of nuclear weapons it would deal a severe blow 
to the peaceful interrelationships between the world's two greatest military powers. It would deal a severe blow to the opinion held of us by peace-loving people in the small and developing nations around the world. And it would deal a severe blow to the opinion and support of the United States enjoyed now by us among our Western allies and those who join with us in mutual defense treaties. It would deal a severe blow to the reputation of our country as a nation desirous of peace. Just as Dr. King and Mahatma Gandhi knew that nonviolence was not the course of cowards, so our search for peace is a sign not of weakness, but of strength. We must also demonstrate that our national human values work so well that they are worthy for other nations to adopt, to emulate. We will never purchase a peace that's merely a surrender of our ideals and beliefs, and neither will we seek to force 